All right, we're good. school levy here in Bellbrook and um, so the reason that we were invited is because we help people deal with conflict all the time so we are mediators facilitators um, we are neutral third parties and I think that that's really important for people to, to know and understand about me um, also from the mediation center is uh, Perry can you say hello thank you um, so we're both here to help just facilitate uh, the, the discussion that will happen tonight um, and before I introduce um, uh, David Graham, I wanted to uh, just briefly go over some of the, uh, the agenda and the ground rules. Um, first of all, um, the principles that you saw when you walked in were respect, education, and civil discourse, and that is what the organizers asked us to help promote tonight. And so uh, we're going to do our best to um, kind of stick to those principles. Um, as part of that, we really ask that there be no personal attacks during uh, the discussion tonight. Um, and the, you know, we just take turns uh, with the, the, the comments. And so if, if we're able to do that without having to go through and write our names down and you know, have like a line to speak, I would love to do that. If not, we can, we can switch it up a little bit and we can, um, we can adjust as we go. And so my job is to just help you uh, kind of have that discussion. Um, and um, I did want to let you know that this is being recorded here. Um, and uh, did you want to talk now about what, what's going to happen with the recording? The intent for this, if I can figure out how to do it, is to post it on YouTube for the benefit of the community so they can watch it. And so uh, I will do my best if it takes me till 6 o'clock in the morning to figure this out and get it posted since our election is, what, nine, eight days out. So uh, hopefully my recorder that hasn't been used in eight years holds together here uh, and uh, if not I brought another camera just like we brought three laptops to make sure that we could uh, get a projection up here and uh, but hopefully I'll, I'll find some way I will make that information known to the Facebook pages that are prominent for the for the for side as well as the no side so people can find the links for it and that's no statement of validation of either website it's just it's the only way I know to get the message out so and we can offer the Mediation Center too. Uh, we have a Facebook page, so we can offer that as a place to, to help get the word out as well about what happens with that. So um, I want to quickly just say that you know the goal tonight is to help people get or share information about the levy and have a civil discussion uh, that's helpful and educational. Um, and um, as part of that, what we wanted to do was first, uh, we wanted to have uh, the County Auditor, David Graham, give a presentation. So I'm going to invite him up 
And while he's speaking and giving his presentation, um, over here we have some uh, sticky notes, and if you um, have a question that comes up, uh, you can certainly ask, I believe you can certainly ask uh, David that question while, while he's speaking, but if you have a question for later on about the overall picture of the levy, uh, either for the school district or for the state legislature, or if you just have a comment that you really want them to know, we would love to collect those uh, while that presentation is going on so that we can kind of see, have a sense of where uh, most of the concerns are and, get, and maybe get a handle on that ahead of time. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to David Graham. Thank you. Okay, so I can't hold the mic because if I hold the mic, I can't talk with my hands. Is everybody okay? Can they hear me all right? Yep. All right. So first, um, I'm here to say I am neither in favor of or opposed to this levy. My job is to provide you with information on how property tax levies work. Um, as I finish a particular section, I will stop for questions on what we're talking about in that section. Because different levies work in different ways, and it's important before we move forward that we understand we're going to be talking about three principal different types of levies and how they work. Um, at the end, like uh, Mr. Greaves said, we can have a, a general discussion. Um, again, I'm here just to talk about the facts, uh, clear up misunderstandings. I know property taxes are a lot more complicated than they should be. This presentation, I've done it many times. I used to label it value times rate. How did it become so complicated? Um, but I took an oath to becoming a more positive person. And I, I'm working on it, right? <laughs> so, so I, I'm a stereotypical accountant. I am a pessimist by nature. So with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and get into the presentation. First of all, property taxes are not fair. Life isn't fair. Get over it and move on. Um, most taxes are based on either what you can afford to pay in the way of an income tax or a sales tax, uh, or services that you receive in the form of maybe dog licenses. Property taxes are based on the value of what you own. Every year, several times a year, I will get that call that says, you are taxing me out of my house. We raised our children in this house, and now I can't afford to keep it. And it's not that I don't have a heart, but value is value, and ultimately, the voters vote on the tax rates. My job is to determine what the value of your property is. And if we don't have a valuation argument, there's really not a whole lot I can do to hold um, So, uh, again, anybody wants to say it real quick, property taxes aren't fair, you can go ahead and yell at me right now, and then we'll be done with the unfair part. Um, so, why do we use property taxes? Property taxes give us a stable source of income. You'll see that tax rates are adjusted when valuations change either upward or downward, and so they create this stable source of income. And this stability is the one thing that property taxes offer that income and sales tax cannot offer. When the economy uh, went through the recession, we have two cities that have no income tax, they have property taxes, the city of Bellbrook and the city of Beaver Creek. Neither one was hurt nearly as bad by the recession as what cities like Xenia and Fairborn were, who rely heavily on income tax. So when people's income went down, their revenue saw a, a significant decrease. So that's why we use property taxes. And then I will have my one little negative thing in here. Um, how did it become so complicated? First of all, we have assessment ratios. So I, my job is to appraise your property, but your tax rate, your tax rate is actually applied to an assessed value, which is equal to 35% of your appraised value. All real property, you take the appraised value times 35%, you get your assessed value. We ended up with that because long before the county auditor was responsible for uh, uh, appraising every property, we had uh, county assessors, and then the state came in and checked to see how the county assessors were doing in terms of what sales were versus their appraised value, and the statewide average was 35%. So sales were 30, or uh, appraised values were 35% of what the sales prices were, so they required auditors to increase the appraised values to market values, and in exchange, applied an assessment ratio. Um, we also have effective tax rates, which we'll get into a lot um, in 
So I'm going to kind of skip it here, but just know that the rate you actually pay is less than the rate that you generally vote on. And then a mill. And, and I can give you the definition of a mill, and it's not going to mean anything more than what a mill does. A mill is equal to a dollar of tax for every thousand dollars of assessed value. So the simple formula to calculate how much a mill will cost on a $100,000 home is to take $100,000 times your assessment ratio of 35% gives you $35,000. Take that one mill divided by 1,000 and you get $35. So one mill levy will cost a property owner $35 for every $100,000 that you raise the value. And also, um, I don't always flip slides, so if somebody wants to be in charge of saying David, you're talking on a completely different subject than what the slide is out there. Don't, don't hesitate. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Uh, the frequency evaluation updates, we do a reappraisal every six years. We've got a reappraisal coming up for 2020, which will affect your taxes in 2021. Okay. That actually involves inspecting the property. Now, inspections have changed a lot since I've been in the office. I've been in there for nearly 20 years now. We used to actually send data collectors out to look at every property. Well, you know what personnel costs are, so what we've started doing is relying on a lot of aerial photography where we focus straight down. We take oblique imagery where we are getting it at an angle, and then we also send out road crews to take pictures of the front of houses so that the actual appraisers can look at these three things to assess the condition of the house. It's not perfect, but believe me, it's a lot cheaper than other alternatives. And then annually, of course, we pick up any new construction that occurs in the demolition. Um, you're going to hear me talk a lot about non-reappraisal changes. Non-reappraisal changes are these other things we pick up. New tornado, tornado hit out uh, by, on Clifton Road. A number of barns were destroyed. Demolition. Um, you could have a property that used to be taxable become tax exempt. Uh, there's a grocery store in Xenia that uh, was converted into a church. So all those are different types of things that can occur to value other than just my reappraisal changes. Okay, I know I went through values real mildly. Are there any specific questions on values that you want me to address right now? And no, there's not a dark board or a wheel that we spin. <laughs> all right. So we'll move on. Uh, the first type of levy we're going to talk about is a levy that you never voted on. It's inside millage. It was established in 1933 when we used to have 15 mills of millage available to every taxing district. Because of the Great Depression, it was reduced from 15 down to 10. So those 10 mills are shared among all the taxing subdivisions that were in existence in 1933. The Career Center does not have any inside millage because Career Centers did not exist in statute in 1933. So all of their levies are voted levies. So this millage is set by the Budget Commission, or can only be adjusted by the Budget Commission. Um, it's actually a matter of statute and how it's allocated. Uh, and these are what you would consider your typical taxes, tax rates, where if your value goes up 10%, your taxes on this levy go up 10%. During the recession, if your value went down 10%, your taxes on that inside millage went down 10%. But it's only on that 10 mils limit of inside millage, and that's shared by all the subdivisions in that taxing district. Any questions on inside millage? That one's easy. It's what we typically think of. The next levy type is a fixed sum levy. Um, these are voted to generate a specific dollar amount. So the, the most common kinds are emergency levies, which Belvoir Sugar Creek School District does not have any emergency levies, but they're the only school district in Green County that doesn't. Um, and then we also have bond levies, which you do have a bond levy. A lot of the information I'm going to be talking about, I will exclude bond rates or bond levies, and I do that just because that money can only be used to retire that debt. It's not available to say, hey, we've got extra money in our bond retirement fund, let's move it over to the general. It's statutorily prohibited. So I exclude bond rates from a lot of the discussions I have. You voted to, for that new school building to be built, and you gave them 25 or 30 years to repay that debt. So bond, these rates are set each year by the Budget Commission. 
And I actually have an example in here about how we, we would calculate it. It's pretty simple. I need to generate uh, $50 million. No, I need to generate $200,000, and then I have a total valuation of $50 million. Ends up to be four mills, you can see the formula. It really is that simple. That's how we set the bond rates. So think about what happens here as values go up. I'm still, it doesn't matter what happens, I'm still trying to generate $200,000. So if values go up, whether it's because of a reappraisal or because it's new construction that occurs, that rate comes down because it's still only going to generate $200,000. The converse is also true. If values go down, then that rate is going to go up so that it still generates $200,000. Everybody good with the fixed sum levels? Yes, sir. So the amount individuals would pay on that, if we had more development, those new houses would pay a new portion? Yes, they would take over a piece of the portion. So if you think that $200,000 is ultimately where you've got to get to, and each person's value represents their percentage of the total value, represents their share of that $200,000. As value goes up, whether it's because of reappraisal or new construction, you, in new construction's case, you're broadening, you're spreading that value across more properties. All right. So there, a new development really doesn't bring more money in. It just kind of on, on this type of levy, it does not. But remember, I, I only bring it up because we have the bond issue here. Um, it, it's not part of their operating money to start with. So they do not have any emergency levies, which. You know, we'll talk about the 20 mil floor and why emergency levies are so popular in other areas. Thank you. So the, the last levy type that we're going to discuss, and there are a couple of others, but we don't have them here, so I just dropped them. Um, it, it's the most common and the most complex. So now, why your value changes impacts the revenue that the school district gets. So this 7.9 mil levy, I think I have this memorized by now. 7.5? Okay. Um, that it is one of these types of levies. That's why it's currently collecting at around two mils. It was first voted in in 1981, and all these reappraisal changes that have occurred that has caused values to increase has caused the effective rate. Notice the voted rate, so when, when I say fixed rate levy, keep in mind, it's only the voted portion that's fixed. The portion that you actually pay based on is the effective rate, and it continues to decrease as reappraisals occur. As new construction occurs, oh, I'm sorry. As new construction occurs, they, the school district gets more money from Okay, so now, why your value changed is important. Is everybody good? Well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's walk through the example before I ask good questions. Okay, so in, <laughs> so in this scenario, we have the same situation. We have $500,000 in assessed value, and we have a 2 mil levy that generates $1,000 a year. And yes, these numbers are small because they're easier for me to understand, but you could multiply these numbers by whatever factor you wanted, the calculation wouldn't change. So if we have a 1% increase, that was that 1% increase was caused by a reappraisal, you can see our value went up that $5,000, that 1% increase. But what happened is the tax rate was reduced by 1% so that it still generated that $1,000. That is a reappraisal change. Now, if you, on the converse, if you look at the other side and you say, okay, what if we had new construction instead that was a 1% increase? You can see your value increase, again, by that 1%, but the tax rate did not change. Instead, the school district or whoever has this 2 mil levy got a 1% increase in their revenue because this is a non-reappraisal change or it's easier to think of it as a new construction change. Everybody good? If you guys have got this down, then we're going to get through this in record time. So Back. I have a question. Yes. So for the uh, upcoming reappraisal, if uh, I have a $500,000 house, my house is reappraised for $600,000, are you saying that I will not pay more taxes? I will not say that. We're going to get to that in a little bit because... 
Uh, okay. Did everybody hear the question? Did I hear what was the question? Yeah, so I was asking if my house value goes up because of this upcoming reappraisal. If my house value goes up because of this upcoming reappraisal, would I have to pay more taxes? Um, that, that Maybe. How's that for a government answer? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so you have to remember, and I'll jump ahead just a little bit and say that everybody pays the exact same rate. Not everybody's value increases by the exact same percentage. So if you were to say the average increase in value for a given levy was 10%, and that was the average, and your value went up 10%, I would say, yes, you're not going to pay any more on these fixed rate levies. But somebody's going to have had their value increase 15%, and somebody's going to have their value of increase 5%, and it's going to average that 10. And we'll get, through an, we'll get to an example of that shortly. So the theory behind these fixed rate levies, if you think about it in terms of a fire department, they pass a two mil levy, it generates that uh, $1,000. If I reappraise your house, it doesn't mean it costs more money to provide fire service to that property. But if you build another house or a subdivision goes in, the fire department has more property they have to cover, and therefore they need more money in order to cover that area. They have, may have to increase staff. They may have to build a new fire department because you, the subdivision's out in the middle of nowhere and they can't respond quickly enough to it. Everybody good? Yes, sir. Well, what kind of levy am I voting on next week? You are voting on a fixed rate levy. Okay. So, so, and we will, I, I, I wanted to get through the theory part of a lot of this before we started talking about the Bellbrook Sugar Creek specifically, so you understand how all of the levies work in concert with one another. I have a question. Yes, sir. You say this particular levy uh, is a 7.9 or 7.5? It's back here somewhere. 7.5. 7.5. 7 .5. And I keep hearing that that's a renewal. Is it? Are, we are currently being 7.5 you, you are not, but can we hold off? And so I know everybody wants to jump to the specifics. I want to stay in theory land for just a little bit longer before we start talking about the Sugar Creek levy specifically. Okay? We'll, we'll get there, and if I don't answer your question at that time, by all means, hammer me again. Yes, sir? Is the multiplier factor on existing property and new property, new construction, the same? Yes. So. Everybody pays that same rate. So when you pick up new construction, they pay the effective rate for that levy that is in existence at that time. Okay, the, the arithmetic that's involved in it has a multiplier. What is that? Is that square foot price? No, okay. You're, when you want to talk about square foot price, you're talking about value. And I'll be happy to come back and reconvene this group when I'm closer to knowing my reappraisal values, and I can speak intelligently about value changes. Um, but when you talk about rates, the value change impacts the rate. Where the new construction is distorted, distorted and higher than the existing values, because the existing values are driven by sales of existing property, whereas the new construction is driven by cost factors divided by the square foot. So generally speaking, we use the cost factor for everything. So I, I was going to try to avoid valuation questions, but so we we do we use a model to predict the most likely sales price per property. Well, I question that all the time every single day, and if you wanted to do it, I could spend hours on that. But these are the existing houses are not getting a fair shake because the value is being boosted up by the stuff that's being built today. So, Enormous amounts of not really items back to the price that you guys tax. Okay, so uh, here I'm going to cut it off with this final comment to you. The sales in those existing neighborhoods are what we use to determine the value of those properties. We do not compare a brand new $350,000 house to a $150,000 house sitting on South London Drive. There's no comparison that can be done when you arrive at those values, and we don't do it. Thank you. Okay, so 
because this is important, we are going to go through it one more time. The summary of different levy types we have inside village moves in direct proportion to your value change. Now, the other thing I'm going to point out here is everything I'm talking about, I'm not talking about your tax bill. I'm talking about the revenue that the subdivision gets from your, your levy. This has nothing to do with John Q. Public's tax bill. We'll tie that all together later, too. So we have the voted fixed sum levies. They are going to generate a specific amount of money. As values go up, the rate comes down. They generate that specific amount of money, period. Then you have voted fixed rate millage, where it, how your value changes determines what happens to, that, to the revenue that the school district or whoever would get. So if it's a reappraisal change, the effective tax rate is reduced and it produces the same amount of money. If it's a new construction change, then the, the uh, subdivision gets additional revenue from that. And because I like to hammer points, as my kids would tell you, over and over and over again, I actually have a math uh, a system up here that kind of points that out. So you can see we've got the same scenarios. We have a $35,000 assessed value, a 10 mil inside millage, we increased our values in total by 4.29%. And as you can see, the revenue from our inside village increased 4.29%. If you look at our fixed sum levies, the same increases occurred, 2.86%. Oh. <laughs> um, so we've got uh, the, the rate decrease. It decreased by less than the 4.29%. But you can see that the revenue that it produced is exactly the same. We've got the fixed rate levies where you can see our value increased 4.29%, but our change in taxes, 1.39%, which is tied to the new construction. The tax rate decreased 2.78%, which is tied to this reappraisal change of 2.86%. So you can see what the total impact is. Now I point this out so that you understand every levy acts differently, and if I increase values by 5%, it does not mean everybody's taxes are going to go up 5%. Okay, so taxes are relative to value. So again, taxes are set for everybody in that taxing district for that levy. They're set levy by levy. So this one, I'm just going to jump to the example because this is the best way to understand it. You only have two properties in a, a taxing district that a levy applies to. They each have a value of $35,000. That levy is supposed to generate $140 a year. I reappraise and my value increases by 14% on owner A and it increases by 6% on owner B. So you can see what ended up happening. That tax rate was set so that it still generated $140 a year, but owner A saw a 4% increase in their tax on this levy because their piece of the pie just got bigger relative to the owner B's value. Is everybody good? <laughs> Okay. Okay, so you have owner A here. Everybody's got the same value here. Everybody is equal. They each own 50% of the liability. They know this levy was voted to generate $140 a year. It's a fixed rate levy. So what happens is this tax rate is the same for both, well, it's the same for all properties, and they have equal share of that liability because their values are equal at $35,000 each. When I reappraise, their values are no longer equal. Owner A now owns a bigger percentage of that liability because he has more value than what owner B does. Why? <laughs> because what? the reappraisal dictated that his value went up by more. Because he built a deck and the other house didn't. No, that would be new construction. Oh, okay. so, so now remember, I'm using it in terms of two owners, but if you think about it in terms of subdivisions, you think the values in, let's look at a county wide Countywide levy applies to everybody. Do you think the values in Bellbrook are going to change by the same percentage as the values in Xenia? So now you've got this, that exact example. If you look at it in terms of countywide levy, values change in neighborhoods by different rates. Okay? Are we all there? Okay, so types of ballot issues, we have an additional levy. Obviously, we're not here to talk about that. We all know that that's going to cost you more money. A replacement levy. Confusing language, but what a replacement levy does is it takes the 
current effective rate and brings it back up to the voted rate. So that's the reason you're seeing a tax increase with a replacement of a 7.5 mil levy. If you were to have a renewal levy, that renewal levy would continue that same effective tax rate. 